Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Thanksgiving service where whether you are joining us online or in person, we are so glad that you are here to give thanks to God and to begin this holy week of Thanksgiving, what I consider really to be the beginning of many weeks of giving thanks to God. Before we enter into worship, I want to say just a special thank you to Angie Monalili, who uh, stepped in at the very last minute to help us um, share in worship today and next Sunday as well. Yeah, go ahead and give a, a round of applause. Uh, but to also remember Amelia, our principal accompanist and music director, who found out very unexpectedly on Thursday evening that her father had passed away. So she is arriving in Singapore today to help her mother um, begin to celebrate his life and honor him. So we pause to remember that, knowing that we are connected with her in this important time, but also to thank Angie for stepping in um, so very graciously and, and so very well. Uh, so we are in the midst of Thanksgiving. And some people would say that gratitude is the very heart of our Christian faith. It's the heart and center of Christian character. And I think they might be right. Thanksgiving is all about giving thanks to God. But I think it's also important to remember, especially this year in the 400th anniversary of Thanksgiving, that it is a distinctly American holiday with a particular history a particular history that is complicated, isn't it? So today we're also going to reflect upon our relationship with the indigenous people of America and to repent for the harm that we have caused. When I was growing up, such an idea would have been an afterthought at best. All I really knew about the first Thanksgiving was that it was about pilgrims surviving a bad winter. I was never taught the name of the Native American tribe who so generously helped them and taught them to have the skills needed to survive that winter. I was certainly never taught their cultural or religious traditions. But that first Thanksgiving meal represented something, I think, a moment of hope, a moment of inclusion and mutual respect and it was a very, very brief moment, to be sure. It was a promise of unity and peace that was not kept. But I think with God's help, with grace and reconciliation, that promise can be restored. So on this day, we remember that for thousands of years, this very space where we prayerfully gather in Christ's name was under the care of the Ohlone, the Miwok, in the confederated villages of Lisan. All the beauty that we know comes to us as a gift from God, but also from their stewardship. Their presence in this region is remembered and woven into the history of our community, just like the Wampanoag culture is forever woven into the history of Thanksgiving. Today, let us be mindful of our blessings but also mindful of our need to learn, to heal past hurts, to embrace the contributions of first Americans as well as European settlers so that we can move forward as one human family because this is God's dream for us. It's in that spirit of mutual respect and humble gratitude that we join in singing a song of praise from our Native American Christian siblings called Hallelujah. Let's join together and sing. continue in prayer with me. Creator, we give you thanks for all that you are and all that you bring to us within your creation. 
In Jesus, you placed the gospel in the center of the sacred circle through which all creation is related. On this Thanksgiving Sunday, show us the way to live a grateful, generous, compassionate, and just life. Give us your strength to live together with respect and commitment as we grow in your spirit. For you are God, now and forever. Amen. stand in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Every part of this earth is sacred. Every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every, every mist in the dark woods, every clearing and humming insect is holy. The rocky crest, the meadow, the beast, and all the people all belong to the same family. Teach your children that the earth is our mother. Whatever befalls the earth befalls the children of the earth. We are a part of the earth, and the earth is a part of us. The rivers are our brothers. They quench our thirst. The, the perfumed flowers are our sisters. The air is precious for all of us to share the same breath. The wind that gave our grandparents breath also receives their last sigh. The wind gave our children the spirit of life. This we know. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. This we know, all things are connected. Like, like the blood of Christ unites one family, all things are connected. One God is the same God, whose compassion is equal for all. For, for we did not weave the web of life. life. We, we are, are merely a strand in it. it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Let, Let us give thanks, thanks for, for the web and, and the circle that connects us. Thanks be to God, the God of all. We invite you to remain standing as we sing, Now Thank We All Our God.
invite you all to turn and pass the peace with your brothers and sisters. If you're online, you can do that in the chat or the comment section. And we're going to turn and first wave a greeting to those of our friends who are joining us online. And if you're in the sanctuary, please pass the peace with one another with a very friendly elbow bump. Our scripture reading comes from Deuteronomy 8. Let us hear the word. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters, welling up in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you may eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Take care that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten your fill and have built fine houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks have multiplied, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then do not exalt yourself, forgetting the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrible wilderness, an arid wasteland with poisonous snakes and scorpions. He made water flow for you from flint rock and fed you in the wilderness with mana that your ancestors did not know, to humble you and to test you, and in the end, to do you good. Do not say to yourself, my power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors, as he is doing today. Thanks be to God. There's a Jesuit priest by the name of Anthony DeMello who wrote a story about a woman, a woman who was always complaining about a particular neighbor who lived next door to her and her absolutely horrible housekeeping. One day she invited a friend to come over and she said, just look at it, it's atrocious. Her children are always dirty. Inside and out, that house is just covered in black streaks. You can even look out there and see that the clothing, she's hung on the clothing, lo clothing line, the sheets and the towels, they're covered in dirt. So the friend that had come over decided to go to the window to investigate for herself. She came back to her friend and she said, 
I'm sorry to report, dear, there's nothing wrong with the sheets and the towels. The black streaks are on your own window. <laughs> Sometimes life is a matter of perspective, isn't it? And gratitude is certainly a matter of perspective. It's not really about what we have, it's about what we see, what we appreciate, what we do with it. And it's much more difficult to maintain an, an attitude and spirit of gratitude than it first sounds. I think that Moses knew this very, very well. It's why he writes this particular word of encouragement to our ancient ancestors, the Israelites. He writes this word to them that we hear to today in the eighth chapter of Deuteronomy um, a long time ago after he has been with them for over 40 years. He knows them pretty well. He's watched as they have escaped enslavement in Egypt. He's watched as they've wandered around in the wilderness. They have been cared for and provided for by God's hand with manna and dew. And in every moment, they have received the sufficient grace of God. But they've complained, Prinny too, and he knows this. They're on the precipice now of entering into the promised land, a land overflowing with milk and honey. They'll finally be able to rest, to settle, to build families and lives. And he warns them that they can forget God in times of abundance just as frequently as they can forget God in times of scarcity. He tells them that it will be important to bless God at all times to continue to follow in the ways of God and to remain humble, to not forget that the blessings they are about to enjoy didn't come from their own hand alone. It wasn't just their effort. It was part of God's sustaining grace all the way through their lives. But they forgot, and so do we sometimes, don't we? We forget God's sustaining blessings. We continually believe that the abundance that we have comes from us and us alone. And so we need practices, spiritual practices, or we might even call them postures, to remind us to stay grateful. And I would say to remind us to stay humble, because in reality, humility just might be the essence of Christian character. And it's kneeling in wonder and awe and humility that I would call the very first posture of gratitude. Ten years ago on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, my, at that time, new husband and I took a Sunday off and we thought we would just drive down to Monterey, just kind of meander around and enjoy the day. But, you know, you can't really keep a pastor out of church. So we're driving down the highway and we saw the sign to get off at San Juan Bautista. And we're like, let's just go to the mission just for a moment to see it because it's so beautiful. We were surprised as we entered the doors of the Mission San Juan Bautista to discover that we had entered the doors right in the middle of Spanish language mass. And the congregation was filled to overflowing. Every pew was filled, people were lined along all the sides. And so we took up our place with our siblings standing at the back of the sanctuary. There was a lot that we didn't quite understand about the service. We kind of mumbled along with the songs. We understood when the offering was being taken. And we understood when the priest began to pray the opening Eucharistic prayer that we were meant to kneel along with everyone else. And as I knelt on that hard tile floor, I was overcome with humility and awe and wonder I was overcome with humility about the blessings that we receive from God that do not come from our own hand, those blessings that we take for granted every day. The earth itself, the sun, the rain, the air around us, the food, the incredible diversity 
of plant and animal life that works together despite all its complexity. It's miraculous, and we do nothing to make it so. And I will also overcome with humility to just be in the midst of all of these Christians gathered together across language to just be able to praise God. I understood at least one part of the Eucharist when the priest said, Santos, Santos, Santos. It was holy. It was a holy moment. And then we were invited to get up off of our knees and to pass the peace with one another. And maybe that too is a gesture of gratitude. We were invited to reach out, to hold hands in peace and thanksgiving with our brothers and our sisters. So we kneel in wonder and awe, and we hold hands in peace and unity. I think that that opportunity, the opportunity to hold hands in peace and humility with the whole human family is really the hidden blessing of our Thanksgiving tradition. It's been 400 years since the first Thanksgiving here in America. And strangely, there is still a whole lot that we don't know about what actually happened on that first Thanksgiving celebration. I mean, we eat things like mashed potatoes and turkey and pumpkin pie, and it's almost certain none of that was part of the first meal, right? I don't think we would have enjoyed the first meal very much, actually. I mean, it would have probably included corn and squash because these were part of the crops that the first Americans taught those pilgrims to harvest. Probably would have included fish and venison because these were some of the things that the first Americans taught the pilgrims to hunt. But we don't know really much else. It happened sometime in the fall of 1621, sometime near Plymouth, Massachusetts. There were some European settlers that we call pilgrims, and there were some Wampanoag tribe members who gathered together, and they shared a meal, and they most assuredly gave thanks to the Creator for the abundance of the earth that they were sharing, and for God's sustaining power through a difficult winter. But we don't know much about the relationship between the Wampanoag tribe and those first European settlers. We don't really know if there was deep mutual respect in that moment or not. In fact, some people say that there wasn't, that although there had been at some point, because clearly the Wampanoags had taught the European settlers very much, that on that particular moment on the first Thanksgiving, the Wampanoags hadn't even initially been invited to the celebration. Others say that couldn't really be so because the celebration itself has so much in common with the Native American tradition that was already present in that region. Every fall, there was a three-day harvest celebration that included gaming and eating and giving things away. It was, in fact, named the giveaway or the exchange. And wherever there was extra food or clothing, any kind of resource, it was handed out to the widow, the orphan, or people in need. Sounds strangely familiar, doesn't it? We don't know exactly what it was like, but I hope, maybe I choose to believe, that on that particular day, at least for that one meal, there was a moment of unity, that people of different languages and cultures and religious traditions gathered around a table and for a moment, they had mutual respect for one another's skills and gifts, and they shared a meal, and they gave thanks, and they held hands as true siblings, as God intended. 
maybe it wasn't a moment. We know for certain if it was a moment of mutual respect, it didn't last. Because what followed that first Thanksgiving was genocide, was a tradition of boarding schools, of children being taken from their families and sent to boarding schools where their culture, their language, and their religion were stripped from them. And I am thoroughly embarrassed to say the Methodist Church was a huge part of that process. We know that there was often a forced conversion experience where the Wampanoag tribe was specifically told to pray to the Christian God or be killed. For this, we need to kneel, not in wonder and adoration, but in repentance, in repentance for not following God's commandments, for not walking humbly and doing justice and being kind to all of our brothers and sisters. And yet, I still hope there's something, something redeeming about this distinctly American holiday that we call Thanksgiving. I don't really know what to do with the mixed legacy of it all. I read recently, even just a couple of weeks ago, that those remaining members of the Wampanoag tribe, they do still exist, although there were about 100,000 members of the tribe before Thanksgiving, there are about 2,800 of them now. They say they don't want to celebrate Thanksgiving, that it's a denial of history, that it was the beginning of terror for their community. And I think we need to listen to that perspective. We need to learn from it. If we don't, we're just like that woman standing behind her own dirty window, blaming other people for a reality that's ours. And yet I hope there's something, something redeeming. And I admit, Thanksgiving, it's my favorite holiday by far, and it always has been. And I have such warm childhood memories of gathering in my Aunt Vi's house and the smell of the food cooking as I sat in the living room with my great uncle watching the Macy's, Day's, Macy's Day parade. And then, yeah, the Dallas Cowboys playing the Washington Redskins. There you go. But I think there is something redeeming, isn't there? That moment of unity, the possibility that with God's help, it could still be. That we could learn from that history. That we could learn the terror of what happens when we don't join hands in peace and determine to move forward in a better way. Maybe we could even learn to be grateful that we have the opportunity to kneel in repentance, that we have the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation and that new beginnings are possible. So to live in gratitude, we kneel. To live in gratitude, we join hands with our brothers and sisters, the entire human family, and we try to live in unity and peace. The third gesture of thanksgiving is a simple one. I think it's one we often forget. It's to lift our hands in praise to the giver of all good gifts. It's interesting, isn't it, that sometimes we can get so focused on the blessings themselves, they are so abundant and they're so present all around us, that we forget to consider all of these things are just a glimpse of the generous heart of God, a God who keeps giving and giving and giving. Even when we dishonor those blessings, God just keeps giving. And somehow we forget sometimes to give thanks to God for being God, for being so generous. Or maybe sometimes we don't know how we don't quite know how to name this great mystery. Sometimes our definitions and our words and understandings for God get in our way. 
In fact, there was a, a longtime United Methodist youth pastor named Nina Reeves who talked about this. She said that when she would go to dinner with her interfaith friends, they would often get all caught up in words and definitions and concepts of God, so much so they couldn't even figure out how to say thank you in a way that honored all of their traditions. So finally, they decided they would do something else, a wordless prayer that somehow said it all. They would take their plates full of food, full of the abundance of God, and just lift them up wherever they were as a silent sign of remembrance to the God who is, the God who is somehow beyond all our naming, beyond all our understanding, and yet unites us all. So on this Thanksgiving Day, I hope that we can do that, that we can kneel in wonder, in awe for all that we've been given, but also in a moment of genuine repentance that this history is complicated and sometimes terrifying, that we can also vow to extend our hands in respect, in unity, and peace with the entire human family. And we can take our plates full of the grace of God and lift them up to say thank you. Amen. invited to move into a time of prayer and we'll share our joys and concerns later on after our live streaming has ended and um, reminded that it's been a while since I've explained why we do this and this is simply to protect the privacy of our joys and concerns so that they are not archived on YouTube for life so if you are watching and worshiping online you can enter your prayers in the chat on zoom or in the comment section on YouTube we do pray for all of the prayers that we share throughout the week and then they do go out on the Friday email so that all of us can be reminded of the joys and concerns that we've shared. I want to lift up just one and that is the beautiful flowers today um, are given by Donna Ladoon to honor her grandson's birthday. And as we enter into prayer, I just invite us into a moment of silence to name in our own minds the joys, the blessings that we want to celebrate and also those places 
of brokenness and need that need some healing in our lives and in our world. And then we'll join in prayer together. God of all blessings, source of all life, giver of every good gift, we thank you for the gift of life, for the breath that sustains us, for the bounty of the earth that nurtures us, for the love of family and friends that shapes us, for the wonder of the universe that delights us. We thank you for communities, for families who nurture our becoming, for friends who love us by choice, for companions at work who share our burdens and our daily tasks, for strangers who welcome us into their midst, for people from other lands who call us to grow in understanding, for children who give us hope for the future. We thank you for this day for one more day to give and receive love, for one more day to work for justice and peace, for one more day to experience your presence, for one more day to know you as God with us and for us. We thank you for all our blessings and for forgiving us when we fail to honor them. Move through us your people, to turn our gratitude into actions of healing and reconciliation in your world. We offer this prayer in the way and the love of Christ, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you're worshiping with us online, we'd invite you to pause for a moment of silence and reflection upon the meaning of this Thanksgiving week and then wait for a time of blessing and sending forth. Here in the sanctuary, we have. As our worship comes to an end and you prepare to enter into the week ahead, pause for just a moment to think about the blessings that you have received. Maybe it came through the scripture, through a song, through a prayer. Consider one way that you have received grace and peace and consider how you'll share it with others in the week ahead. As you go, hear these words of blessing. May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Go in peace. Amen.